Uh, my name is Brian Cardarella. I'm going to be talking about holistically built and tested apps in, Elis in Elixir. And first of all, I have to apologize to everyone in the audience uh, for not being there. Unfortunately, uh, this happened in Boston. Um, and my flight was right here in the middle of it. But I, uh, as somebody who runs conferences myself, I, uh, I understand the, uh, the, the frustration and the anxiety that goes along with speakers being late and uh, potentially missing the conference. So a special apology to Jim. And I really appreciate the effort that he's gone through to, uh, to allow me to still speak despite not being on site. Uh, however, despite all that, um, it seems like from what I've seen on Twitter and just from talking with people that the conference is going really well. And you can tell that it's a really good conference because it already has its own meme, which is just fantastic. Uh, so from working with Chris day to day, I can tell you that this is definitely more fact than fiction. All right, um, this, uh, uh, the, the video streaming, I'm not sure which, if you see both me and the slide deck, but if you happen to see me and the audio for sure is being run through an application called MeetSpace. Uh, a friend of mine uh, runs this app, um, uh, his name is Nick Gothier, and he was nice enough to give me a free account uh, to facilitate uh, me speaking on this. So I just like to kind of pimp his company for a little bit. It's, a, um, it's like a Google Hangouts competitor, but it uses WebRTC. Uh, higher quality audio connections, higher quality uh, video connections because it's P2P rather than going through a centralized server. Uh, you should check it out. And then I work at Dockyard. Um, as I'm sure today, people are sick of hearing about Dockyard already, but I promise you I'm the last Dockyard speaker. Okay, so I want to uh, talk about um, first a problem that I see growing in the electric community. I have to be very careful about how I articulate this because I don't want to have it come off as me uh, not wanting to have new people in the community or trying to turn away people that have already come to the community from other languages. Uh, however, uh, there is an acute um, kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding on uh, what Elixir and its potential is. I hear a lot of people saying, and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, I, I've, I've said uh, some of these things myself, but as you begin to learn Elixir and uh, Erlang and you know, the, the, uh, the platform itself, you begin to understand that there are uh, some major differences between itself and the languages that you may be coming from. So uh, we're led to believe that this is kind of the, the, uh, the, the uh, evolution of a uh, man, the, uh, the computer, and then along came Ruby and Rails, and then uh, Phoenix and Elixir are the evolution of Ruby and Rails. Um, I wanna say that no, this is not the case. We, should, we have to really stop uh, kind of having this conversation with, uh, with ourselves and with people outside the community to try to draw them in. I know that Ruby and Rails are a good conversation starter for saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, there's this new thing that's faster. Um, and it's new because that's always fun to play with in a tech, in, uh, as a software engineer. But I think that it's doing ourselves a disservice because what I've seen uh, over the past year or two is that some people transitioning from uh, other languages are kind of just stopping their uh, uh, kind of like their, their journey of becoming an electric developer at the speed, right? They, they are recreating the same ideas, the same kind of uh, uh, li libraries that they did in other languages, and they get the, they get the speed. And like, oh, this is awesome. That's it. I'm done. I want to I wanna hopefully um, dis uh, dissuade everyone in the audience from, uh, from that point of view and uh, do so by talking about the libraries that I've been working on uh, over the past two years. So uh, the, this is, you know, it's a Venn diagram. So this is the Venn diagram of where I see the uh, animation uh, sweet spot of where Elixir is. It's in between composability, uh, distributed systems, and fault tolerance. So the composability allows us to build out APIs uh, that feel really good to actually write on, on a day-to-day -day basis. The distributed nature of it allows us to build out uh, really large systems uh, that can uh, deal with uh, many inbound connections. And uh, uh, if we're talking about like something like Phoenix, then respond very quickly. Fault tolerance allows us to uh, build out these uh, highly robust systems that were otherwise um, either too difficult for some people to build or very complex and costly for some companies to consider building, uh, quote unquote, the, the correct way. Uh, however, I, I don't want to make it seem like these are the only three things that 
uh, Elixir gives us. And I'm going to touch on some of these, some other things in this talk. So compile time, umbrella apps, scalability, macros. I should have included them in a larger Venn diagram, but otherwise I would have ended up with something that looks like a spotted horse, and uh, that's probably not going to look too good for anybody. Okay, so a couple of concepts, uh, querying APIs, composing and sending of mail, uh, smart fixture data, testing payload responses, and parallel acceptance tests. These are the core things and solutions that I've been working on and iterating towards. And I don't want to make it seem like I've solved these problems, at least what I consider to be uh, the good Elixir way, but I think I'm moving in the correct direction. And I'm definitely going to be asking for, um, if these libraries seem of interest to people, for some feedback and, and, and some help on, on building them out. The first of which is probably the lowest hanging fruit. And I'm willing to bet that a lot of people have created this and stumbled upon this pattern within their own applications. Uh, it's a pretty simple pattern. So we may query our API with these key value pairs in the query params, and then we end up building out something like this, right? We, we take advantage of the pattern matching system that exists and recursion, and we can build out a nice query builder very, very quickly um, through Ecto and through uh, uh, in Elixir. So just to break it down, what's happening here in the first function, the index function, we have a uh, we have our params. We pass it into the build query. The result of that we pass into repo all, and then we render out the response. Um, the build query, uh, the params of course come in as a map, and so it goes down to the second function. It detects if it's a map. Yes. Okay. We enter into this function, and then we convert the map to a list, and we recurse into build query. Now it goes down to the third function, and this is a single argument version of it when it's a list. And all it does is it will add the model on as the first argument, and then it recurses again. Now it goes down to the last two functions, and this is the traditional iterate over the list uh, pattern that uh, we all know and love. And all it's simply doing here is building out the query for key value pair. So if foo equals bar, if baz equals cox, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and then once the list is empty, it goes back up the chain, returns uh, the the uh, compose query um, to repo dot all, and we get what we want. So the nice thing about this is that we can have the default be a general catch-all for a uh, key value pair, but if we wanted to match and, and have a, uh, a different uh, query run, um, or rather build out a different uh, rule for uh, a given attribute, we can use the pattern matching to do that. So we could have defined this function right above our catch-all and it will simply detect if the uh, attribute value is updated at, and yes, that's a timestamp value. So we are building out uh, a part of the query that is determining whether or not this post is, uh, is updated at timestamp is greater than or equal to the date value that we're passing in. Uh, this is such a common pattern that I extracted it out to a library called Inquisitor. And uh, it's pretty simple to bring in. So all you do is inside your controller or wherever else you want to use it, uh, you just use Inquisitor and you pass in the model that you want to use for it. It is going to build out a, uh, uh, a function based upon the name of the model, or actually, I guess their schema. What are we calling them now? I don't know what we're calling them. Model, schemas, whatever they are uh, in the future. Um, it's going to build out a, na a named version of that function off of that off of that. So in this case, we have uh, build post query and uh, that other default stuff you get for free. So it, it just uh, a bunch of macros under the hood that's injecting this code into the, uh, into the controller. Now there's some nice security features um, that are baked into it. Uh, you probably do not want to allow just a, you know, run against any field in your model slash schema. Uh, uh, make everything public. So there's a whitelist option and these are opt in. So anything that is not included in, in this list will be disallowed to query against. Uh, they just ignore it. So it's not like if somebody includes a, a key value pair that is not allowed in the whitelist that they get some sort of error. It's just tossed out. We can handle, I hope people can see this because it's a, it was a little bit wide. Um, I had to make it smaller. So we can include uh, virtual attributes. So 
Uh, by that, I don't mean the echo virtual attributes. I just mean the sense that we have um, uh, keys that do not map directly back to a field on our model. And uh, in this case, we may be talking about uh, trying to find posts that are within a given month and a given year, right? So uh, we may have a, uh, a timestamp field called published at, and this contains all that information, but we want to query against just two segments of it. So uh, here we have a, a URL that we're requesting month, year, and then it will come in and it'll actually run this, uh, this fragment function, which is part of Ecto, that allow us to run functions within uh, Postgres or whatever database you're using. In this case, the date part uh, that you see there is a Postgres function. So this will simply just uh, get the part of the date that we're requesting, whether it's month or year, uh, determine the numeric value of it, and it will match against that and uh, build up the query like that. So some other things that we get in Inquisitor are uh, Booleans being typecast, all your params coming in, are uh, the values are strings, so it will determine whether or not that string value is a, you know, the string of true or the string of false. If it is, it will typecast it to Booleans automatically, and then we get a limit handler out of the box. So you can do something like this. Now, um, the really nice thing about uh, writing this in Elixir is that the entire implementation in this library, this is it right here. Uh, I, I stripped out the, um, the comments and the, um, the documentation, but this only, only ended up being 56 lines of code, which is phenomenal. I, if I had to build this in another language, it would, it would most definitely be significantly longer. And I am willing, I didn't really code golf this too much. So I'm willing to bet that someone a lot smarter than me could come through and, uh, and really shrink this down more if they care to. I'm not really, uh, not really too interested in doing that because it meets my needs. So that, you know, to me, shows me some of the power in the allure of Elixir. All right, so the next one. Um, I have to confess that this is uh, not a direct quote. Uh, the reason for that is because, uh, I don't know when it was, maybe six months ago, Jose committed uh, online Twitter side, whatever we want to call it. He, his sort of account is still there, but he just deleted his history and is now retweeting um, I think just the Elixir account or maybe platform and tech as well. Uh, in any event, I can't go back and find the original tweet, but it was something like this, right? Like he was looking for a library to compose email messages in the same way that you do with plug or any other type of uh, pipe based library. So I, I was working on a, uh, an email system at the time and I kind of had something similar. I decided to extract that out and I decided to take it a step further. So if you're unfamiliar with RFC 2822, I am way too familiar with it now. It is the RFC for internet message formatting. It's a uh, pretty big specification. And uh, it just details how, uh, you know, what the spec is for, for internet email. Um, pretty much uh, single part, multi-part attachments, uh, uh, encodings, um, Everything that you would want to know about emails is, is in this spec. So I wrote a uh, I wrote a library called Mail. Now there's a there's a kind of an interesting story or funny story to go along with this. I created a repo on GitHub called Elixir Mail, and I just put in the README that uh, this the goal of the project was to be RFC 2822 compliant. Uh, somebody must have been following me on GitHub and. Um, right away, they posted it to Hacker News, and so within two days, and there was nothing in the repo. There was probably just like a few lines of code. Nothing was really done yet, but this hit number one on Hacker News uh, without any anything to really show for it. So if we were concerned about the uh, the Elixir hype cycle, I think that this may may be a good indicator of it, and we're definitely heading up. I don't think we're at the top yet. I don't think we're we're you know. I don't think we're, uh, I think we still have a little bit of ways to go. Maybe I can move that, that graphic down a little bit, but um, a completely empty repo uh, hitting number one in Hacker News seems to me uh, a bit funny. Anyway, okay, so some of the goals of mail. Uh, actually, here are the three goals. Uh, message composing, rendering, and parsing only. That's all that mail does. Does not handle sending or receiving of messages. I'm leaving that up to other libraries. I have a library I'll be talking about in a few minutes that 
uses mail, but mail can be used by anybody. And um, that's really, really what I'm hoping for, that it becomes this primitive that other people are building messaging platforms off of. And here's the API. So if we want to compose a single part message, we can build a new, uh, a new mail message. And then we put text into it. We put the to uh, header field, we put the from, we put the subject. And it builds out this, uh, uh, this map, essentially, that can be rendered out into a RFC 2822 compliant message. If we want to do a multi-part message, we can do this right here. We can add text, we can add HTML, uh, we can put attachments, a, a number of attachments. It can either be a path, um, a relative path to the file, or we can add a tuple with the name of the file and then the, uh, the, uh, the data of the file. And mail will be smart enough about uh, trying to determine the MIME type of the, uh, of the file. Sorry, of the attachments. And once we have the message, we can render it out with one of the included renderers. Um, right now, there is only an RFC 2822 renderer. I decided to namespace it in the unlikely event that there is another specification I don't know about that's out there. I didn't want to uh, foot gun myself. And something that I think a lot of people have been using it for quite a bit uh, is the message parsing. So it will take a, uh, a spec compliant uh, email message and it will parse it back into an uh, Elixir map, uh, whether this is single part or multi-part. Uh, has all encodings in there, base64, 8-bit, quoted printable, 7-bit. Uh, there are probably a lot of edge cases because this is an old specification. And I, even though the, the library itself has been around for a year, I'm not work, I've been working on it for a year. I work on it on and off as I need be. And I receive a few PRs every now and then. So I'll have to say that I, I need some help with the library. I'd really like it if this became kind of like the, the core library that the community used and there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of love poured into it to make it as robust as possible. I think the number one thing that uh, the library really needs is a spec test suite, uh, something that really uh, allows us to determine where all those edge cases be, are. And of course, that uh, determines vetting out the full RFC 2022. Okay, so that's mail. But one thing that I've, uh, I've seen with some of the mail sending libraries that are out there is that, and this goes back to my original premise around, along how we're kind of taking existing uh, things we've done in other languages and applying them to Elixir, is that uh, we see like adapter-based libraries. And I think that's fantastic because that's actually where mine landed. But um, I, I feel like they, they, uh, a lot of these libraries kind of stop short in the sense that we have to really consider some, with something like Elixir and Erlang, we don't consider you know, a few people using our application. We have to consider, okay, how does this application operate? How does this library operate under millions of users? How does it operate under a uh, distributed uh, system? How does it operate under, uh, how do we make sure that the messages that are going out guarantee delivery? So I, I set up with this kind of base idea in mind, right? So if we, uh, think about not how we're going to send 100 messages or 1,000 messages. How are we going to send a billion emails to this system? Something that really competes with and guarantee um, a high percentage of those emails being received or in, in, the, unlikely, in the somewhat likely event that the message uh, is not received, how do we handle it properly? So kind of a, a little animation here to, uh, to describe um, what I'm talking about here is his little guy. He is sitting at his computer and he has an email he's going to send. So he sends that email. Uh, however, there are a whole bunch of other emails waiting to go out. So how do we ensure that the outgoing, uh, that the message server we're connecting to, we're not going over some sort of rate limit, right? How do we ensure that the message server that we're connecting to isn't having some sort of downtime? And how do we make sure that we don't lose that message that's going out? Or how do we make sure that the message is going out uh, isn't malformed in some way, causing some sort of error and being notified or being able to handle that properly? So with Courier, we hopefully are going to find ourselves in a place where we can handle all those edge cases and make sure that uh, on the other side, the, re the recipient receives their letter, uh, their email rather, um, 
uh, or we can you know find out what wrong what went wrong and handle that properly or put it in some sort of queue to be uh, examined later so courier um, still a very early version of it and here is the API for mail so to uh, to send a, uh, a message through courier um, the first one two three four five lines of that are mail the last line is is courier so we just build out a, uh, a message the mail and then we deliver it to bring courier into your application you're going to find a mailer so uh, this is going to um, uh, use courier and then you want to bring in your OTP app so it likely won't be called my app in your case you're then going to add uh, the courier uh, your mailer rather to the supervisor tree the reason for this is because under the hood courier actually has a pooler and a scheduler that is uh, uh, watching for new messages that are scheduled to be sent out and then it will um, grab a uh, pool limit on those messages and iterate and try to send out every single one that it can and finally we configure the mailer in this case we're using a SMTP adapter uh, and we set some of our configuration options for that there career comes with some adapter types out of the box so SMTP logger uh, test web adapter which is actually a separate library courier dash web uh, sorry courier underscore web um, and this will have a, uh, a web interface for interacting with your uh, with your messages so it's good for development um, or you can build your own and building your own custom adapter is super simple I try to make it as dead simple as possible it takes two functions start link and in most cases you're probably going to just return ignore out of this uh, and then the delivery function so delivery uh, sorry, deliver function uh, takes the message and then it just takes the options. Uh, the options uh, will be comprised of maybe the, uh, uh, the configuration options that you set up or um, some scheduling options. And then you can define your custom mailer uh, delivery function right, right in there. You can schedule deliveries for the future. So uh, if you include the uh, at and then a daytime, and currently it, uh, if daytime is not working off of the Elixir calendar, uh, uh, stuff. It is a um, uh, like the Erlang tuple, so the year, month, day, comma, hour, minute, second. I think um, I'd really like it if someone could PR uh, support for calendar. That'd be pretty nice. You can uh, configure for rate limiting and delivery frequency. So if you wanted to attempt to send more than 50 messages at once, um, if you wanted your scheduler to wake up. Uh, every 100 milliseconds to, to check for new messages whoops to be delivered you can render from within Phoenix so courier.render will take any Phoenix view uh, this myapp.mailer view has nothing to do with courier it's just the name of the module it's a regular Phoenix view uh, it will actually uh, determine the uh, type of part so in this case on the first one because it's determining that the MIME type of the file is text, um, it will do a uh, put text into the message. And the second one, it will determine that the MIME type is HTML. And so it will do a put HTML into the message. And then the uh, last section there is the data that we're passing off to the view. Then we deliver it. Another nice thing uh, with Elixir is that testing uh, the message delivery ended up being really simple to implement. Uh, so uh, here we just add the uh, the test adapter. I like to set the delivery timeout for something super high so I can go in and inspect um, if I need to. And the del delivery interval is zero. We don't need to have anything higher than that right now for our, for our test suite at least. We, there's no reason to uh, to block on anything. And then the implement implementation of the test. This is pulled directly from uh, from Dockyard.com. So this is our API backend, and this is when somebody contacts us so if uh, you look at line the second line within the test we have a cert receive and then we're looking for the delivered uh, message and then the value being passed back is the message itself and we will time out after 500 milliseconds so if the message is not received within 500 milliseconds the uh, basically an error is uh, is raised in our test fails otherwise we continue on and we get back the original um, message that was built out with um with mail so so this ends up being a really nice uh kind of end-to-end -end testing solution for for message delivery and again 
I need help. I, I would love for uh, community involvement in this one. Uh, hardening of deliveries, I've, uh, I've gone through and um, I think that it's pretty hard right now, um, but I'd like for you know, some other eyeballs on it and perhaps even some discussion around whether or not my implementation is correct. Uh, one thing I'd really like to do is uh, distribution across adapters. So let's imagine that you have um, uh, AWS to send your email, right? And there's some sort of rate limit that's attached to your account. You could open up multiple accounts and then you could have multiple adapters attached to each different account. And you could have a scheduler that does some sort of uh, round robin uh, delivery across the different uh, adapter types. Uh, this would be ideal. And then at that point, we have something that's like super scalable, um, something that uh, handles uh, like, uh, if a sorry, I think I forgot to mention, but if a message fails, um, uh, there's a handler for that. Um, one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, how, how much farther away is this system from something that a MailChimp might give you? Now, there's a whole aspect of like MailChimp has a UI and, you know, there's whitelisting involved. But one of, one of the, from a marketing perspective, uh, one of the big things that MailChimp does is that it handles uh, message delivery guarantee. And it will make sure that your mailing list is going out to the widest audience possible. Um, and these type of services are expensive. So I, I see, you know, as we evolve our tools and uh, new, new things become available like Courier, um, there may be opportunity to replace out and reduce the costs across organizations uh, with the properly built out libraries. All right, now we're gonna talk about data, but not this type of data. This type of data, boring data. Um, you know, we, we start our applications with these really simple data models, right? This one relates to this one, that one relates to this one. And when we are uh, stubbing on and fit in creating factories or fixtures for our data in our test suite, um, uh, the simple modeling of our data fits really well with certain solutions. However, it's not too long until the maturity of the application brings you to something not much unlike this. It looks like a mess, but uh, this is in somebody's head somewhere. So, uh, you know, complex data relationships and uh, especially when we start getting into foreign key constraints and like how data, having certain data available before other data is, is created in a database, ends up being a tricky problem to solve uh, when it comes to fixture data. However, uh, some of the ways that we can write Elixir uh, libraries, um, I hope to demonstrate uh, bringing some nice solutions to this problem. So something I've been working on again for a while is ecto fixtures and it's, uh, the implementation I'm going to talk about right now is currently on a branch. So the first thing you want to do is add an Ecto fixture compiler because it's working off of non uh, Elixir files. The fixtures themselves are non Elixir files. So we have a custom compiler that will actually uh, detect uh, any file changes within the fixtures themselves and will attempt to, uh, if the file changes deleted or the new one, it will make sure everything recompiles properly. And then the fixture file. Uh, I get the syntax somewhat Elixir-like, but it's not clearly not Elixir, right? So on the first line, we're defining the, uh, the model associated with this fixture, we're defining the repo associated with this fixture, and then each grouping there is a named grouping. So post one is the name of the group, or name of the record rather, and then we have the key value pairs within there. Uh, sorry, that should say use fixtures at the top. Uh, then the API for actually using the fixture uh, within your test, uh, within your test file, is we just call fixtures and then pass an array of uh, fixtures that we want to want to bring in. These are then um, these are grouped off of the uh, the compiled fixture data, uh, inserted into the database, and then made available to the data key on the second argument to your test. Now um, the managing like. Gathering the data, composing it, and sorting the database um, for just single records is actually a fairly, fairly trivial process. Um, the more complex side is when we start getting into all these different relationship types. Right? How do we guarantee 
that if a, um, especially because ecto migrations, when we're talking about relationships between records, it will set up a foreign key constraint. So the odds are that your data, if you're trying to work off a child record, it's not going to allow the insertion of that child record until its parent is available in the database. So if we go back to uh, this file that we added in to, uh, to bring in our ecto fixtures, uh, the nice thing here is that uh, use will allow us to do some compile time. Uh, I don't want to use the word magic things. I'll say things instead of magic. It'll do compile time things. And uh, the thing specifically that it does here is that it will, uh, at compile time, read all the fixture files, build a giant uh, uh, map of all that fixture data, and then it will actually store all the data based upon the relationships that define within the associated model. So it builds out a DAG. If you're unfamiliar with the DAG, it's a directed acyclic graph. And it will, it will set up all of the edges between the data points properly. Then um, at that point, we have a DAG, we have all the data. When we request, we go back to um, this one right here. When we request post one and post two, it will attempt to get post one and post two out of that, uh, out of that giant map. It will also determine what other records are associated with post one and post two and take those out as well. So whether they're child or parent records. Then when we attempt to insert the records in the database, it does a topological search, uh, sort rather, on all the records so that we're making sure that um, always the, uh, the parent most records are being inserted prior to child records. And this is working uh, in actual fixtures for one-to-one, one, one to many, many to many, and through records. So um, this, this is a beginner level talk. So uh, if, if you're new to programming or new to Elixir and new to compiled languages, you may be thinking, you know, what is compile time? How, you know, what is this, what does it do for me? So uh, a, a quick primer, um, there are three, um, I'd say life cycles within your application. You have compile time, which is, uh, it's not really, I mean, like fuzzy kind of present in, in, in other languages. But in a language that requires compilation, like Elixir, it's, uh, it's like the build time of your application, right? Um, a good analogy of this might be in JavaScript land, where if you're running something in Babel and you are transpiling it to JavaScript, the transpilation process can be considered the compile time. So uh, we have compile time, and anything that is done in compile time is done once. So if we are calculating a value at compile time or we're building out some sort of uh, giant map like I am with Ecto fixtures, that is done once. And then that value is available to us throughout the rest of the life cycle of the application. However, uh, things that are pushed down to compile time, of course, increase compile time. And uh, usually it is more complex to do things at compile time. We have boot time. And uh, this is, these are things that are happening while your application is instantiating. So uh, when you type Nix, phoenix.server, right, that is boot time. And then once it becomes available. Uh, generally, Elixir is very fast at this because it pushes a lot of stuff into the compile time. Um, but you can still do calculations at boot time. And then again, that is a one-time calculation that you incur the cost once during boot time. You're increasing boot time, but you're uh, uh, theoretically going to be able to reuse that cache value now uh, with a relatively low to no cost in the future. Uh, the reason why you may not want to push things to boot time is let's say your server goes down, you need to, you need to bring it back up again, right? Uh, anything pushed to boot time at that point could increase the, uh, the time that your, takes your server to instantiate. And finally, we have runtime, and runtime are calculations that are being done on the fly. So we have, um, uh, uh, this is the slowest of all of them, but also generally the, the easiest for implementation. Um, Oh, well, the thing I wanted to say about uh, this is that uh, what's really nice in that uh, in Elixir is that we have this really great interface um, through the macro system and through um, some other uh, functionality to build out and push functionality out to compile time with, um, with relative ease, uh, at least in my experience compared to other languages. And something I've been focused on over the past few months is thinking about how I can be pushing more and more things to compile time. It's actually influenced the way that I think in other languages as well. Um, so that, that's, been, that's been kind of a, a nice eye-opener for me. 
Some other features of Ecto fixtures are serialization uh, and void assertions, data enums. So if you have, let's say, uh, red, green, blue, and you have multiple records, it will just kind of loop over these, these numerated values. So the first record will get red, second red, record green, third record blue, fourth record red, et cetera. Uh, and then we have sequences. So if you have user dash one at the example.com, I'm uh, sorry, user dash sequence number at example.com, uh, it will just continue to count over that sequence uh, for as many records as you're generating. And again, Ecto fixtures is under development. Um, so if this library and some of the concepts I talked about are of interest to you, uh, in your organization, you know, please, uh, you know, please reach out to me. I'm on IRC and I'm on, uh, on Slack and uh, I'd love to chat about them. Okay, so one of the last libraries, I think I'm, I got a little bit more time. Uh, one of the last libraries um, is uh, something that saved uh, us quite a bit of time. So this is a, uh, well, it's a blob of JSON, but specifically it's JSON API. If you're unfamiliar with JSON API, the specification, um, for lack of a better term, it's very verbose. And testing it can be very difficult and frustrating. The reason for that is because JSON API is meant for machines to talk to machines. It's not meant for people to talk to machines or machines to talk to people. It's meant to provide this consistent, reliable data schema so that you don't have to go out and create you know, custom handlers or adapters on your client or on your server uh, for reading and understanding what uh, one machine is telling another. Um, unfortunately, when we are making it easier for machines to talk to each other, we make it more difficult for people to interact with these things sometimes. So um, the API that we ended up with for, for testing this um, is a library called JSON API Assert. And it makes, I think, very beautiful, and this is like, I'll show you an example of how much code is cleaned up in a moment. Um, it, it makes a like, very simple, it takes a very simple con on concept of pipes and composability and distills it down to in this, this simple API that gives us a ton of power and allows us to do something that would have taken hundreds of lines of code to do. I'm not joking, like this, this right here, uh, writing out all these assertions, um, maybe not hundreds, plural, maybe close to 100 lines of, uh, of code to write it out properly. And that's actually very difficult to maintain. It's not flexible at all. Um, if we, for whatever reason, decide to change um, the type of records that are coming back or the number of records, it's just, it's a big pain to go in and make these changes. However, with JSON API, we can now just pass in the payload. The payload's being returned. The original unadulterated uh, payload is being returned up out of every single function here. And then we pass in the given record we expect to find within the payload. So it will go in and determine whether or not a record of this type, an ID exists in the payload. Uh, in this case, the first line of the data section of the payload. And if it does, it will actually do a comparison of the uh, attribute values and determine if, okay, okay, this, is, uh, this has uh, name, age, and the values match on both ends. That assertion is true. And um, a certain relationship will determine the uh, relationships between different pieces of data in the payload. So uh, JSON API cert is, um, is uh, again available on our GitHub projects. And this is um, a, for the sake of fitting on the screen, um, the smallest example I could find. So this would be a, um, uh, this might be a way that you're writing uh, kind of like the payload assertions. You could try to traverse the object, um, but what we found um, before we uh, got JSON API cert was something that was easier was just to do expected payload and then assert that the payload we're receiving is the same as the expected payload. So this is, uh, I don't know how many lines, but it's, uh, it's a few. And now with JSON API cert, this is all it is, right? So we are starting the data, we start the relationship, and that's done. Um, again, I need help. So uh, you may not care about JSON API. It's a very Ember type of thing. Um, the, uh, but I think that the general concept is good, right? So uh, testing out JSON payloads in general, regardless of whether or not that the JSON API spec uh, is, I feel like a, a difficult process. So it'd be really nice if uh, we had some sort of generic JSON primitive testing library that allowed us to pass in a JSON section and kind of traverse down and determine whether or not it exists in the larger payload. 
and then JSON API could start could use that to build on top of it. If uh, somebody doesn't tackle this, I'll probably end up doing it myself just because I, I would really like it. All right, so finally in my last section. So uh, some of you may be thinking like, oh, my tests are fast, Elixir, what are you talking about? Uh, I would posit that you're not doing uh, for, uh, single page application development or client application development, or maybe running um, your, your web apps through a, uh, um, you know, through a browser environment to test, because that is still slow. So at Docker, we build Ember applications. I'm gonna talk about an Ember library in a second, but very, very briefly, um, just as a matter of kind of uh, explaining what, what this process is. And this isn't something that I've written. This is something that I want. This is something that I feel like would be a huge win. I feel like it may only be possible in Elixir, uh, maybe. So um, the way we end up testing our, our applications at Dockyard, um, we try to test them this way, is you know, we have you know, the backend API and then we'll have the front end client, two separate repositories. And we try to treat it in the same way you may treat an iPhone application. So, you, you don't have the iPhone application uh, source code embedded within your, your server source code. We treat uh, our client-side application as a first-class citizen. And within Ember, there's a nice acceptance test suite that will actually run through QUnit and do all the interactions. So it will fill out form elements, it will click on this, it will wait for a page to render, it will assert uh, whether this content's on the page, et cetera. And for any even somewhat mature application, you can imagine that there are gonna be quite a good number of acceptance tests as you're running through you know, the happy path of certain things. Now on top of that, I add in the additional complexity that uh, I do not wanna be running against stubs and mocks. I, I have been bitten too many times by that in my career. Um, I am very much of the opinion that if you are um, uh, testing, acceptance testing only with stubs and mocks, then you're only testing the stubs and box, you're not actually testing it, that it works in the real world. So the best way to do this is for it to actually consume the server. And uh, the way that we have this set up is that during the uh, uh, setup clause of our junior test, it will um, it will do a blocking uh, uh, AJAX request to the server, uh, request that some data is set up, make sure the database is clean, uh, insert the fixtures, and then it'll return back you know, 200 status code um, at that point, the tests are free to run. And uh, we have these nice, as long as they're running in serial, nice uh, uh, isolated test environments. And as you imagine that on top of the, the browser testing, um, doing it this way is just incredibly slow. So hence the, uh, the skeleton picture here. So enter Ember exam. And Ember exam is written by a uh, developer at LinkedIn, Trent Willis. Um, if taking advantage of some stuff that exists in QUnit, newer QUnit, to run your tests in parallel. So Ember exam allows you to very easily run your tests in parallel. And uh, he introduced this um, over a year ago at a conference I was running in Boston. And I, I saw that, I was like, oh wow, that, that's a really interesting concept. I wonder if you know, there might be um, some way to use this on a higher level. Uh, last year at ElixirConf, I, I grabbed Jose and I just start pelting them with questions because uh, Ecto 2.0 had come out and there's this whole concept now around concurrent transactional tests. We have the sandbox and we can actually uh, tell our tests to run in parallel even when they're hitting the database, which is awesome. So um, one thing I'd like to uh, see if it's possible, and I think it may be, because under the hood, the sandbox is just using agent and you have a name for the agent and then it's keeping the transaction within there. Um, so within the QUnit, uh, QUnit, each QUnit test can reflect upon itself to determine what the current name of the test that's running. What if we could actually send the, the name of the test over to the server? Uh, it could use that name as the unique identifier for the current sandbox. And then we could potentially have our, our acceptance tests running in parallel. Uh, now, if this was possible, I, I don't know of other languages or frameworks that have um, this type of concurrent transactional testing available to it. And that's why I think that this may only be something currently that's uh, at least easily accessible.
accessible and, and easy to implement, relatively easy to implement in Elixir and Phoenix. Um, I think this would be a huge win, and I'm sure that outside of Ember and outside of uh, client-side application development, there may be other ways to, to utilize something like that. So I want to say that um, as Elixir developers and people transitioning to the language, uh, we should not just rely upon the speed. Uh, the speed is nice, but there is a, uh, there's a lot more to the language than, than just the, the speed itself. We should allow Elixir to educate us on how we can do more with less. And the way to do that is we have to learn our tools and allow us to build for the future. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Brian Cardarella. I am at B Cardarella pretty much everywhere. I'm the CEO of Dockyard, and uh, we build uh, Elixir and Phoenix applications for forward-thinking companies. So if you're interested in working with us, if you have a project, a company, and an application, you're looking to migrate over to Phoenix and, and Elixir, or if you're looking to build out a new product to compete in a marketplace with existing competitors and build out something that could definitely uh, you know, kick their butt, uh, contact us, dockyard.com slash hire us. And that's it. Okay, since, since we're um, right about at break time, um, we're going to take time for just one short question. Is there somebody with a short question? No? Uh, so, unfortunately, you're between us and the break, so no questions. Give them a hand. <laughs>